Hi everyone, I'm Chester and today I'm going to talk about what happened with Ravelry. So first off, let's go on what Ravelry basically is because some of you know me and therefore won't have gone, huh? But some of you don't know me so you might have gone, huh? The brief of it is that Ravelry is a database for knitters and crocheters primarily to store and sell patterns. But that doesn't really explain what Ravelry actually is, so let's go into a bit more detail. The first thing you, know, you need to know about Ravelry is that it has about 8 million users. Or, well, there is no proper citation for 8 million users, but it is a number that gets thrown around a lot, especially in a number of news articles that came out around this time last year. But we know that in 2014 it definitely had 4 million users. So, lots of users and 6 developers. It's basically a very small foundation that grew way out of hand because it's a very tight-knit, loyal community which is reinforced by not only the patterns but a number of forums that Ravelry has as well. So that's where we are in today with Ravelry. Now, like I said, Ravelry is an extremely tight-knit community. Those six developers are known by the community by their first names and people are extremely loyal and strongly like Ravelry. This was reinforced in June last year when the Ravelry mods decided that anything pro-Trump would be counted as racism and therefore would be against the code of conduct. So this is both in the forums and in the patterns. This obviously was somewhat controversial and a lot of racist users left the site and then a lot of non-racist users became even more loyal for Ravelry. Now that's not to say that it's necessarily all good. Ravelry does have some problems. One thing that has been noted is that despite the fact that the forum posts are overwhelmingly positive, this can be used as a form of harassment. For example, if you post, oh my dog died today, and then the posts are all completely positive and happy, then that is a form of harassment. Knitting also as a community, as many communities, does have quite a bad racism problem and also quite a big fat phobia problem, as you can imagine from sizing charts. So not perfect, but still really quite good as these things go. And then everything went to shit. So the alternate title for this talk is What Not To Do When You're A Small Community And You Fuck Up. Let's just give you a brief summary of how everything blew up first. On the 16th of June of this year, 2020, Ravelry announced a new website. This, while it had very good reviews at the start, soon it soon became apparent that there were quite a few bad accessibility problems. Now, this wasn't as much of an issue at first, but it ended up becoming an extremely nasty situation and having a lot of issues and the community is quite badly hurt at the moment. So I'd like to explore what happened, why it went wrong so badly, because it's not the first time a new website has had accessibility issues. It is, however, amazing in how nasty the discourse got. But first off, why do you care? This is a website about knitting. You presume that viewer do not knit, although I suppose you're a computer scientist, so you're slightly more likely to. But, well, yes, that is the reason why I care. It's my community, it's my house, and I have a bit of a morbid curiosity when it comes to this sort of thing. But why do you care? Well, I'd say that a good reason to care is because it is a really good case study of what happens when a small volunteer-run community fucks up badly and then doesn't know what to do next. And the thing is, I'm pretty sure that we're all involved in small volunteer-run communities. So oh, clearly university societies, but also open source projects or conventions. Generally, you're going to find these places where people are extremely invested in what's going on and knowing just how badly it can go, I believe, is quite valuable. So I am going to go over six posts done by Ravelry 
and also primarily the responses to these posts. The way I've done this is via a qualitative analysis technique called content analysis. So I have gone to the six posts on Twitter and I have taken the first 25 responses, um, obviously in incognito mode, because as I will show you later, I had quite some biases and they did show up in my algorithm. Um, so the first 25 responses of these, and then I have gone through them and I have taken pieces of text which I think correspond to certain codes. Then from those codes, I can interpret the data and draw conclusions. And now I haven't done this all alone. While I did work out the codes myself, this is a technique called emergent codes, which I used because there hasn't, as far as I know, been a study that reflects quite what happened. I did go over these codes with some other coders. Thank you, Marks and Ethan. Now, before we get into the data, I'm just going to expose my biases because in qualitative analysis, having biases is not necessarily a bad thing. It offers you a window through which you can interpret the data. However, it is very important to know what these biases are. So as I've said, I have quite a lot of interest in community building and how communities are built and the like. So obviously there's that. There is also the fact that most of you probably know that I care quite a bit about accessibility and I know slightly more than your general public about how accessibility works, especially in development. And the most important thing, I think, is that my section of the knitting community also cares about these things. Which means that when I first started doing my content analysis and didn't think to go into incognito mode, the overwhelming majority of responses had to do with accessibility. Hi, editing Chester over here. I ma realized I managed to leave out half a slide at this point, and I do think that it's important to talk about. This is, as I mentioned, a light study. It's not fully rigorous, partly because I don't have that much data, and partly because I didn't spend that much time on what data I had because of the constraints of the format. I do think that it's a good way to get an indication of what happened, though, and inform our opinions on it. So let's go over the first post now. On the 16th of June, Ravelry announced their new website. This is overwhelmingly well received. There is a couple of people who don't like what it looks like, but they will themselves admit that it's just that they dislike change. They don't, they accept that it is not anything wrong with the website, just their personal dislike of it. And overwhelmingly, and people who will appear later in this saga, really like the website and have a lot of affection for the team. Later that same evening, I cannot do the voice, I'm sorry. Later that same evening, Ravelry posts another tweet saying that they ha there have been quite a few requests for a dark mode and that those requests are listened to as well as various bugs that are going on. This, again, is quite well received, although we're starting to get a slight problem arising, which is that people are starting to notice the various accessibility issues. They're telling Ravelry about this because they've just been told that they're listened to, and many people are grateful for the response, which is another one of the codes that I've noticed in this data. Many people are grateful for the response, but all, yet more are describing various issues that have come up. Let's give you a quick summary of the issues. The font is not wide enough, it doesn't have enough contrast, the pages can be visually busy, bullet points are not used, instead they seem to be using some sort of emoji, um, there is no alt text, and worst of all, the website appears to be causing migraines, headaches, and even epilepsy shocks for people, especially the animated login page, which many people point to as a big problem for them. On the 26th of June, Ravel reposted a blog post on their new website. This blog post goes over the new website, it acknowledges that there have been problems, but overall calls the website a success. It also points out a couple of bug fixes that they have made, set, uh, fixes some accessibility issues. For example, it gives people the ability to change their font, it also gives people the ability to add a CSS skin to the website to make it seem 
to make it look more like old Ravelry, and which I will come back to later because it is still problematic. Um, it points out that the overwhelming majority of users have been using the website and that there is a 106% sign up rate compared to June of the previous year. Now, this number and the rest of the blog post feels dishonest. And I think that by focusing on this number, we can sort of explore why a lot of this was received quite badly, which I will go into more detail as I go on with this talk. The website was released in June. The June before that was the incident that I mentioned with hate speech and Trump supporters. As you can probably imagine, quite a few people left the website at that point. So pointing it out as a 100% increase at this time last year is quite a dishonest thing to do. Especially as many people have pointed out, a lot of accessibility experts have been going on to Ravelry to try and figure out what is going on. One thing that is important to note is that they also mention that they have been centering accessibility in their design and using various tools to check their Google accessibility score. They also mention that there is no magic bullet for accessibility. Again, this feels quite dishonest because if you consider the fact that there are actually quite a few good practices like have alt text and use high contrast fonts that are well known and well documented and also quite often appear in these sorts of tools. Again, there's a feeling of dishonesty that comes out from this blog post. And indeed, this blog post is not well received. There is quite a lot of anger in the responses now. As you can see, I have in my coding, I have separated out things that are simply a description of issues and things that are anger at issues. And now we're starting to see overwhelming anger, both at some unprofessional behavior, but also at the ignorance of accessibility. And here we also see that instead of simple descriptions of accessibility issues, people are now starting to give anecdotes of specific issues that they have had themselves. They are saying, I had an epilepsy fit because of this. I believe that this anecdote is, this, uh, this tendency towards anecdotes is similar to the expression of anger. I believe that it is meant to not only explain that they are real people, but to solicit an emotional response from people. Because again, this is a very tight knit community. People tend to be very aware that others in that community are real people, especially when you end up with big names, which generally people with high engagement and therefore higher up on the algorithm to in responses to a tweet are, are likely to be. I'd like to give a sidebar right now because the biggest of these issues, the epilepsy fits and the migraines and the headaches has been the subject of some discussion and some disbelief. I was talking about it to some knitter friends who aren't quite as online as I am, and they mentioned that it seemed to them like it was some form of mass hysteria or mass hallucination. Now, there are a couple of things I want to point out here. Firstly, the fact that I strongly dislike the term hysteria. Um, I, it is the having a uterus disease. And so I am very dubious of anything that uses the term. Now, I had a quick look around to see if this was backed up by anything. And I did find a couple of pop science articles, although both appear to reference each other and not much else. Um, so there are some people who definitely think that this is a thing. However, I think that it doesn't actually change the problems with Ravelry. After all, we still have the new website that is causing the issue. And the way to fix this, I would argue, is to roll back to the old website, which we know that while it is not perfect, is not actively harming people at this moment. On the 30th of June, one of the developers of Ravelry sent out a letter. 
This one, unlike the previous blog post, was not actually on the website, and this is specified in the tweet. This also means that I can actually show images of it, because I have chosen not to use any images of the new Ravelry website due to the problems that it has caused. There are also no images of Ravelry in the letter, and it is generally sent out to sue the community. It apologizes for the behavior of one of the other developers, who at this point has been sending out harassing emails and has been closing down forums and Instagram pages in order to stop people talking about this issue and calling others liars. It also apologizes for the harm that Ravelry has caused, but points out that they cannot afford to get accessibility experts because they are a volunteer-run community and any manner of getting funds goes against their beliefs. This mainly means that they do not want to serve ads on the website, nor do they want to get some sort of person invested in it. Which, to an extent, this makes sense, although my personal argument would be that if you do not have the funds to hire an accessibility expert, you do not have the funds to make a new website. Now, let's have a look at how this was received. The responses to these were rather mixed. You get quite a few people who have been on the outskirts of this issue being thankful that this was finally addressed, but you still have some people who are still angry at the ignorance and also at the unprofessional behaviour shown by some of the team. They feel that they have been ignored and that these issues have now gone on enough. There is no longer so much an anger at the specific issues themselves, but at the behaviour of the people who are ignoring these issues or harassing people because of them. And then there's this third faction, which I have labelled as affection for Ravelry, but I'm having quite a lot of trouble putting into a s short code dictionary. Essentially, these are the people who are saying that one shouldn't let the haters get them down, or that the website was great in the first place and that there's nothing wrong with it, and that the Ravelry team is great and that they are sad that the Ravelry team has been criticised. And I would like to get into what is going on here because I feel like it is quite an important part of what the results were at large. If you have a community or a group of people that you are very loyal to, and you perceive that group being attacked by outsiders. Your first reaction is to close in and defend that community, and not really look at what the criticisms are. Now, obviously, the people criticising Ravelry at this point are not outsiders. They are knitters, they are often people who sell their patterns on Ravelry, which makes this situation more tragic, because you are losing good people who contribute to the community. But because there are 8 million people, it is really hard to know every piece of the community. And because of the algorithm problems that I've shown earlier, it is really hard to see various people's opinions if you are not in incognito mode. So as far as you know, if you're not, if you haven't got the same bias as I do, is that Ravelry has been repeatedly telling people that they're listening and, and fixing things, and you haven't actually seen what their critics are. So there is, I do understand where this is coming from, and I do believe that internalised ableism has a lot to play in it, because you, with problems with accessibility, the instinct is to downplay it, to say, well, it's not a real issue. So you start getting this sort of almost factionalism, between the two groups, the people who care about accessibility and the people who care about Ravelry, which should not be a division, but is one that is starting to emerge. One important thing to note here is that after Jess's letter, Ravelry no longer talks about the issues surrounding accessibility. To them, it is a done issue. They had these issues, they apologised for them, they addressed them as best as they could, although many people believe that it is not enough, and now it's over. They're not going to talk about it again, and the two tweets that I'm going to examine now 
are not specifically to do with this. On the 24th of July, so almost a whole month later after the letter from Jess... Oh no, major erratum here. Here is where I got the dates mixed up. Jess's letter was on the 30th of July, not June, placing it after the routine announcement of things going up on the blog. I don't think this affects the analysis of my situation that much, but take the whole Ravelry is treating this issue as closed thing with a grain of salt. Sorry about that. Next time I proofread, I'll make sure to proofread the dates of the things that I'm saying too. Scrum, back to your regularly scheduled talk. Ravelry tweets a new thing saying, pointing to their blogs, saying that any new updates will be found on their blog. This is rather a routine announcement. They've got things like this in the past as well, and I think that it is interesting to compare to the blog post that happened before this blow up to see what the difference is. Unfortunately, I can't do the same analysis on those tweets as the ones that I've done so far, because they simply do not have even 25 responses, let alone 25 top responses that I can go to. But on the whole, the responses that do exist are generally just heart emojis or positive statements about Ravelry. So going into this, this is what I want you to know. This is a routine thing. This is not anything to do about the whole blow up. Now, if you look at the chart, you will see that there is an overwhelmingly negative reaction, more so even than the response from Jess, which I think can be attributed to a couple of factors. The first is that the letter from Jess was conciliatory, so she apologised and people were thankful for it. So the second factor, I believe, to the sheer amount of dislike and anger that there is in the response to this tweet is that as it is a routine announcement, and as I have said previously, these usually have very few responses, only the people who currently care about the situation are going to bother to respond. So it's no longer a situation where some people feel the need to defend what's going on versus some people feel the need to express their anger, because the people who feel the need to defend what's going on don't realise that it's still going on. And then a couple of weeks later, another update. Once again, Ravelry have updated their website. They have a couple of bug fixes, they've made some things slightly more accessible, although to, specifically for screen readers, although to note, I would like to point out that these have both... Um, these have not fixed either the alt text or the bullet points, which I know because there are now in the response a couple of descriptions of accessibility failures. Still, it is overwhelmingly angry, and you can see this in the responses. There are, this time, a couple of people defending it, mostly people who like the aesthetic and point, want to point this out. But it is still an overwhelming amount of anger, and also the now emergent behaviour of people expressing betrayal and saying that they can't remain with Ravelry. Saying that they have used Ravelry in the past, but that they can now no longer be a part of this community and have to leave it. This slightly correlates, correlates with the off-rav movement, a hashtag started during this whole mess where various people started posting patterns and not putting them onto Ravelry, but instead on the off-rav hashtag and hosting events on this hashtag. So now we have quite a big contingent of people who have been a part of this community and who have been engaging with this community, simply leaving. And I believe that that is, honestly, the most tragic part of this whole story. In June of 2019, when the period I discussed where a lot of users left because of the Trump thing, it made the environment safer. It made the environment a nicer environment to be in, because it was one where racism would not be tolerated. The people who left were people who insisted that they should be able to hurt others. Here, it isn't those people who have left. It is the people who are being hurt themselves. And often, it is the people with the skills 
to know how to change things from being hurt. And through that, I believe that Ravelry has made our community one that's far less rich and far less pleasant to be in. Because now there are still going to be those hurt people, those angry people, and because they were such a central part of the community, there is going to be quite a lot of loss when, once they've left. Could Ravelry have done better? Yes. Yes. They could have. And I'm going to go over the various things that I think could have made Ravelry go better, but first I'd like to draw people's attention to Cloudwith. Similarly to Ravelry, this website that was a fork of live terminal had various accessibility issues. However, these were addressed immediately and many people left with quite a lot of affection for it because they knew that they had been heard. But how do I think that specifically Ravelry could have gone better? Well, honestly, it starts out with admitting error. They should have admitted their error and they should have centered accessibility once they realized that it was a problem. If this had meant rolling back and then starting again and redeveloping, having hired an accessibility expert, then they should have done that. And if that was beyond their funds, they should have waited until they had the funds to do it. It's worth noting that, again, as I said, Ravelry has an extremely loyal community. I do not think that it is beyond the realm of possibility that had they started crowdfunding to hire an accessibility expert, they wouldn't have managed it. I even believe that if they had said, if they had looked through the tweet, they probably would have found an accessibility expert offering their services as a volunteer. Unfortunately, they did not do that. But I think that there's slightly more that they could have done to make it slightly less vitriolic. And I think that some of that has to do with moderation. I mentioned earlier that developers reached out in slightly harassing emails to the various people who were criticizing this new website. They also shut down the forums in which this was being discussed and it stopped posting on Instagram so that this could not be discussed. If instead of this, they had moderated the discussion, both between the hurt parties and the developers, but also between the hurt parties, the developers, and the people who didn't know that there was an issue to begin with, I believe that everything would have gone a lot more smoothly. Again, there were quite a few people while this were go was going on who did not realize that this was an issue, or whose only exposure to the issue was the various responses done by the team, which threw a lot of the critics into very bad lights. I think that a large portion of the issues that I have just described is because Ravelry didn't really mo notice its own growth. While it did celebrate its 4 million users back in 2014, and while that 8 million number must have come from somewhere, presumably the developer team, I don't think that anyone involved really grasped what that actually meant. At this stage, Ravelry was the livelihood for quite a few knitters, especially knitters who are disabled and who didn't really, couldn't afford to go to, say, fairs and things like that. And a lot of the extent of the hurt was just how big an impact this website being unusable for them was. It wasn't just that, oh, they couldn't interact with their hobby in this way anymore, although I believe that that is a huge issue, but also that they had lost a significant source of income and were dealing with medical problems because of this. And I believe that a lot of the issues are not only the developer team not realizing this, but also a lot of the audience to what was going on not realizing this. You see a lot of these responses being things like, well, this website is free, what do people expect? But the thing is, for a lot of these people, the website wasn't free. They were selling patterns on the website and Ravelry was getting a cut. It was a platform that they were using for their job. And I think that understanding that and understanding the different views that people had and not realizing that these views were in conflict is a big part of the issue. Thank you all for coming to this talk.
I will probably, if you are watching this live, I will be on Discord to answer any questions that you might have. If not, feel free to email me. Um, I will put my email in the description. I will also add links to both the slides and the speaker notes, but also the data that I have analyzed so that you can have a look over them later. Thank you.